This is a really important message to me because it's something that God has given to me for the entire time that I've walked with him for the last 35 years. And even as a child, it was something that he brought forth to me. And the title for today is God Breathed. And I'd like to start with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along by the Holy Spirit. There are people who hear wrong. There are people who walk out in the spirit of self, sometimes speaking out what they believe to be a prophecy, but they're hearing out of their heads and not connected to the Holy Ghost. And there are even familiar spirits that will try to operate and put forth a false word with a false spirit. But any true prophecy of God comes forth because God willed it to, and because God brings it forth with his breath upon his people to speak forth for him. So if your attitude is right, your heart is right, your spirit is right, your motives are right, then you're going to have the desire to put forth what God wants to say, even if it isn't popular. I mean, there are times when God has had me to give a word that, you know, people don't really want to hear it. They don't want to hear what God is speaking. They want to hear what, you know, their buddy down the street has to say or what somebody else thinks or feels or believes, but it isn't God's spirit and it's not what he wants you to hear and know. So an accurate word, a clean word that's filled with the Holy Spirit is what you want and it's what you want to be able to move in. And there's so much to this message of how God moves by his spirit, by his breath. It's the place of God's glory, the place where he saturates the atmosphere and it's so full of him that you can hear clearly and walk easily and just put forth the power of the most high. That's where God wants us to be. It's moving in the presence and the power of the glory. And the enemy has fought this so hard this week. It's like, I knew it was a message God wanted out there because it definitely was one Satan did not. And God took me to an unusual place to speak about some of these things. I hadn't been in the book of Ezra for a really long time. We are going to the book of Ezra, chapter one, and let's see, let's begin, it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and even put it in writing. See, when God wants to move by his spirit, he can do anything. He can bring it forth even upon kings. And back then, kings and priests were how God moved. But it says God stirred him up, a king of Persia. And throughout all the kingdom, he proclaimed forth. A proclamation is operates pretty much the exact same way as prophecy is God caused him to speak out and say for us something by his spirit that he wanted said. And it's by the leading of the spirit of God. And verse two says, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, I have no idea why Cyrus believed that God gave him all the kingdoms of the earth, and I couldn't find any scripture that would concur that God said that, but Cyrus believed that God gave him all the kingdoms of the earth, and he charged him to build him a house at Jerusalem. So Cyrus, a king, believed that God spoke to him and said, you, Cyrus, build me a house a temple in Jerusalem. And this was after the Israelites had been held captive for 70 years and they were coming back, you know, to 
the area and Cyrus was stirred up by the spirit of the Lord to say, whoever is among you of all God's people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judea and rebuild the house of God. And the God of Israel in Jerusalem, he is God. So the king, which is like, you know, our president is saying, God told me to build him a temple. I am telling you, if you are his child, get ready, go to Jerusalem, get prepared to build this temple because God, he is the God. So that's what we need here in the United States for our presidents to know that God is God and he wants his temple built. And in any place where a survivor of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews sojourns, any place you go that someone there is a survivor, let the men of that place assist you with silver and gold and goods and beasts and free will offerings for the house of the God of Jerusalem. So he not only proclaimed and declared, God wants me to do this. I'm giving you permission, go to Jerusalem, begin the building of this temple. But the king himself is telling them, give them supply, give them what they need, give them gold and silver, give them all the animals they need to help them, give them offerings, give them whatever's needed, give them full supply. Then arose up the heads of the father's families and the priests and the Levites and all those whose spirit God stirred up. So God not only stirred up Cyrus, he stirred up the people. He didn't stir up all the people. He stirred up the people whom he wanted to go. He stirred up those who he knew would do the job, who he knew would faithfully obey him and go in and do their best to begin the building of the temple. And all those who were around them aided them with vessels of silver, gold, goods, and beasts, and precious things besides all and all the willingly and freely was offered. Everybody around wanted to get involved, but God stirred up those whom he wanted to go. And he stirred up those who he wanted to give. And he stirred up those who would be a part of just blessing those who he stirred up to go. So he's taking care of the whole thing. He's bringing his spirit on Cyrus, the king, on the children of Israel, whom he's sending back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and upon those who he's stirring up to give. So the spirit of the Lord can do it all. He can, you know, give the proclamation. He can give the supply. He can give the right people, the right heart to go. And it can give those around who can't go or who shouldn't go, who are in need to not be a part, who need to stay out of the way and just be a supplier. There's sometimes there are people who are called in the body of Christ just to give funds, just to give money. It's like, it's not your place to go. It's your place to give. And you have to be obedient to that as well. So Cyrus, the king brought out even the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought from Jerusalem when he took the city and he had put them into the house of his, their gods. So Cyrus even made sure they had full supply and then he gave them back what was stolen from them from Nebuchadnezzar the king who had taken what belonged in the temple of the Lord and put it in the house of their idols Cyrus gave that back as well. And so Cyrus, king of Persia, directed the treasure to bring forth and count out all that needed to be done, all the paperwork for the legitimate heirs and all the things, everything was taken care of and all this stuff was given. It was given and given and given and given. Everything that belonged to them was given back to them. And then chapter two just talks about the genealogy of all the people and everyone who was a remnant and who was, you know, a part of Jerusalem and the building of the temple and what, what was needed. And then we get into chapter three and it says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. So God brought forth those whom he knew could come into unity, who could come into a corporate agreement of unity to do this as one man, 
<laughs> no bickering, no arguing, no fighting, no trying to, you know, be in charge and I'm the big cojona and you stay out of my way. No, everybody came together with one heart, one united force to do it God's way. And that's what sometimes hinders the body of Christ from doing what God wants them to do is because people can't come together as one man. And that's what we need to be able to do. And then they built the altar of God and rebuilt that so that they can begin giving sacrifices. But it says um, that they did it for fear was upon them because of the people that were around. And it's never God's will for you to offer sacrifices to him because of fear. But um, the Lord honored them and accepted their sacrifices. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet built. And then we get to verse 10. It says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their vestments with trumpets and the Levites, sons of Asaph, in their symbols to praise the Lord after the order of David, king of Israel, how it had been set up during the time of David. And they sang responsively to the music, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house was laid. But then it says, many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had been there in the past, when the temple was there, when Solomon's temple was built, it said that they were there when the foundation was laid before their eyes and they wept with a loud voice, though many shouted with joy because they knew what it used to be. And it's like, okay, boys, yes, we have a foundation, but we need <laughs> to keep going. We got to build the temple not just a foundation. But then it was the Samaritans who came, who pretended to be friends and wanted to, oh, we want to help you with this work. We want to get involved. We, we sacrificed to your God, but the people said, no, no, you're not a part of this. This is for the children of Israel. This is the house of our God. And we don't want that. Well, then the Samaritans got angry and started to attack. And in verse four, it says the Samaritans, the people of the land continually weakened their hands and troubled and terrified them in their building. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate the purposes of God and the plans of the day of Cyrus, the king of Persia. And it's like, how many times, like today, I said, all I've had for days is warfare, battle, attack, the enemy. He doesn't like when you're stepping out to do something God's asking you to do. And they were stepping out. The spirit of the Lord obviously involved, stirred up Cyrus, stirred up the people, stirred up the others to give. Everything was set in place. And yet then the enemy comes to try to bring harm and stop what God has for you to do. They don't get their way. You don't give them what they want. And all of a sudden they're agitated and irritated. It's like, well, if you're not going to give us what we want, then we're not going to let you have what you want. And they begin the attack. And they even came, you know, to, to the reign of the next king and began to argue and fight. And you see what they're doing? You see what they're building? You see how much stuff they have? You see all this supply, how big they're making this? You know they're coming against you, king, and they're stirring up trouble and they're, you know, causing problems and issues and trying to defeat what God wants to do. And, um, you know, we see a lot of that going on in the world today. Everybody's arguing. Everybody's fighting. Nobody can agree. This this is wrong. That's wrong. Everyone's doing what they want to do instead of what God wants, instead of what God declared and decreed over this nation and other nations. And God's opinion, Israel belongs to him and the United States belongs to him. And it needs to be what God wants to do. And in verse 12, it says, be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have come to Jerusalem, this rebellious and bad city they're rebuilding and have restored its walls and repaired the foundations. Be it known to the king that if the city's rebuilt and the walls finished, then they will not pay tribute or customs or or a toll or the royal revenue, it will be diminished, Father, because that because that's what they're doing. They're trying to bring an attack. And so he they're 
causing gossip and rumors and all of that. And we see that even here in this nation, you know, people are standing for Christian beliefs. People are standing to, you know, have freedoms in the schools with our children and freedoms in churches and freedoms to have a moral operation of God in the nation are being criticized and attacked. And I watched a video this morning where they're calling the new prime minister of Italy, they're calling her a fascist because she's standing for, for God and family. And they're calling her a fascist and saying how horrible she is because she's standing up for the, the family and for God and for what is right. And she's saying, I am a woman, I am a mother, I am a Christian, and they are furious and speaking horrible evil against her. And it's going on in every nation of the earth right now. The, the body of Christ has to wake up and realize that you are being viciously attacked and set up by the people of the world system who don't want you around. They don't want you involved in anything, you know, in the earth because they want to turn things around and make it a country that has no God, a country that isn't serving the Lord, that doesn't even allow it to be put forth. That's their plan. And we need to be uh, alert and wide open to that fact and know it. And then they said, in 14, now because we eat the salt of the king's palace and it's not proper for us to witness the king's discredit, therefore we send to inform the king. No, they could care less about the king. They cared about themselves. They cared about what they wanted. They cared about what their agenda is and what they're trying to do. And God just really, you know, has to put his foot down and step in there and say, look, you're not getting away with this. I don't care what you want. And verse 24, then the work on the house of God in Jerusalem stopped until the second year of Darius the first, king of Persia. And then God stepped in again. All right, it's time. I know I can move and we can get back on track with this. Darius is going to listen when you talk to him. And he brought in the prophets on the scene. He brought in Hag Haggai and Zechariah to prophesy and speak to the people and to encourage them and get them built up and get them ready to stand. And they boldly spoke forth to King Darius. It's like, okay, King, this is, this is what happened. We had permission to rebuild the temple. Cyrus gave us that. If you look in the records, you look in the paperwork, you'll find that. Cyrus told us we could rebuild, but then the Samaritans came against us and stopped us and caused all these issues. And they had to rise up with strength and power and get the people encouraged again to do what God wanted done. And let's see, I think in um, ver or chapter five, verse 17. So now if it seems good to the king, let a search be made of the royal archives and find the paperwork of King Cyrus issued a decree to build this house, and he did. And so we see again in chapter six, King Darius did exactly the same as King Cyrus. He gave them not only permission to go, go, yes, go, build your temple. You had permission. I don't know how this happened. And then he again repeated the same process of making sure they had supply. And verse seven says, leave the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree as to what you shall do for these elders of the Jews. So not only are you to stop harassing them, but I'm telling you what to do to help them. The cost is to be paid in full to these men at once from the king's revenue, the tribute of the province west of the river and they, that they may not be hindered. And then he did even more than that. He did the thing that Cyrus neglected to do. Cyrus heard from God, make the proclamation, build me a temple, give them supply, give them permission to go. But he never thought about, oh, I need to send an armed guard to take care of them and battle for them and protect them. Well, this king said, 
in verse 11 and 12. Also, I make a decree that whoever shall change or infringe on this order, let a beam be pulled from his own house and erected, then let him be fastened to it and let his house be made a dunghill for this. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow all kings and people who put forth their hands to alter this or to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make a decree. Let it be executed speedily and exactly. So he gave them permission. He gave proclamation. He gave them supply. He gave them everything they needed out of his own coffers, out of his own revenue. He took it and gave it to them. And then he declared in decree, nobody's going to stop you. If they do, I got your back. And we're going to deal with them. And they're going to pay the cost of harassing you and trying to stop you. So God came to the place where he could do what needed to be done to take care of the situation, to proclaim it forth and see the proclamation come forth. God will always bring forth his prophecies. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes the enemy steps up against you. Sometimes you got a battle on your hands. Sometimes, you know, you're thinking, okay, I'll have this by next year. And it's like, nope, 10 years down the road, and you're still standing and believing. If you are still standing and believing, and you still have that word in your spirit, and it's best if you keep it in front of your eyes. And if you do um, what it takes to keep it alive and breathe on it with the breath of God, then that's the best way to see it come to pass. Because sometimes, you know, God is just, but other people are not. God is just, but the earth is not. The world is filled with people who are following after the father of lies, who don't care about God, don't care about God's will, don't care that God gave you a prophecy. They don't care. They're not interested. It doesn't matter to them. That is justice, and he will restore and he'll use kings to do so. If God has to use a king to give you what was stolen from you and to restore to you, he can do that. God stirred up and impelled the people and they finished what they started. That's what God wanted. He wanted the work finished. And all through it, you'll see all through here dotted, I highlighted, just said, and the good hand of the Lord was upon them. The good hand of God was upon them. He kept moving. He kept doing his, his best to encourage the people, to support the people, to edify the people, to keep them going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep doing. And verse eight of chapter nine says, and now for a brief moment, Grace has been shown to us by the Lord God, who has left us a remnant to escape and has given us a secure hold on his holy place, that our God may brighten our eyes and give us a little reviving. And God wants that for us. He wants us to succeed and be blessed and be given all that is good. And he wants to prosper us. And sometimes you have to stand in the midst of extreme persecution, but God will do it. If you're faithful, God is faithful. I'd like you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And it says, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up in way of remembrance. Now that's Peter. He had been, you know, talking to the disciples and trying to encourage them, talking to them that God gives you everything suited to life and godliness. He'll lead you, he'll guide you, he'll protect you, he'll bless you, he'll give you the strength to stand, to have his nature in the earth. And then it just names um, in verse five through eight, it talks about all of those things that God wants you to have in your life, diligence, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and Christian love. And that it's a process of developing. But if we're faithful to keep working and developing and keep maturing, then that's how God has for us to be. Verse nine, this says, 
whoever lacks these qualities is blind, spiritually short-sighted and seeing only what's near to him and has become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Because of this, brethren, be all the more eager to make sure to strengthen, to make steadfast your calling and your election. For if you do this, you will never stumble or fall. And that's the whole point of it. The whole point of Christianity is to begin where you begin and go forward. And yeah, you get knocked backwards sometimes. And a lot of people backslide and they have to come back to it later in life. But when you're standing with God, keep developing. Don't stay in the same place. Begin with diligence, then develop your faith. Uh, uh, develop your faith and grow in the virtue. That's the anointing. Grow in the anointing. Get the knowledge. Get the self-control so you can develop yourself. Be steadfast. Be godly. Do it with brotherly affection and then take it out to people who aren't your brothers, you know, to, to the world system. Sometimes it's easier to go out to the world system to the, than your brothers in Christ. It really is. And you need to be faithful to just keep doing that. But Peter is talking and telling them all these things and then saying, as long as I am in this body, I want to stir you up. So the same as God stirred up Cyrus, stirred up the people, stirred up those who are positioned above us, want to stir us up in a way to cause you to remember. Since I know that the laying aside of this body will come speedily, as our Lord Jesus made clear to me, moreover, I will diligently endeavor to see to it that even after I'm gone and after I'm deceased, you may be able at all times to call these things to mind. So how was he to do that back in that day? Writings. He wrote what he wrote. He did his part. They didn't have videos back then. So we do what we do. We do our blogs. We do our videos. We do what we can do to stir people up. That as long as we're in this body, you know, I've had a long walk down this Christian path and I've learned a lot of things. And if I can stir people up and keep them going forward in any area that I've learned, then it's my responsibility to do those writings, to do those videos, to do the teaching, do what it is I have on the inside of me that I know that other people can use. And that's, you know, just as important as God stirring people up is for us as Christians to stir each other up, to encourage one another in the Lord and to do it God's way. So um, verse 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 says, every scripture is God breathed. Every scripture Old covenant, new covenant is all God breathed by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, reproof, conviction of sin, correction of error and discipline in obedience and for training in righteousness, in holy living and conformity to God's will and thought, purpose and action so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So not only does God stir uh, up people, breathing his breath of life on people and stirring up their spirits, but he's put his breath on every single word that is in the word of God. It's not only that he um, spoke by inspiration of the Holy Ghost to these writers, to the people who put it down on paper, but he breathed his life upon the word of God so that the word and the spirit are in agreement. And sometimes we get that, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's our spirits off kilter and we don't understand that the power of God is on his word. It's on the people who wrote it. It's on the words themselves. It's an operating part of God in the earth. So God breathes on people. God breathes on his word. 
God breathed into man the breath of life to start the whole thing off. God breathes on everything that has to do with him. He brings forth the breath of life. All scripture is God breathed. And then there's one last passage I wanted to give to you. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six and seven. That is why I remind you to stir up and rekindle the embers that are in you. Fan the flame of and keep burning the gracious gift of God, that inner fire that is in you by means of the laying on of my hands with those of the elders of your, at your ordination. For God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity of cowardice, of craving and cringing and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and a well-balanced mind to discipline and self-control. So this is um, Paul speaking to Timothy. Stir yourself up, fan the flames. We prayed for you. We laid hands on you. You were ordained into ministry by men of God who God used to lay hands on you and to release gifts and anointings upon you. And I know I've had that many times. I've had people lay hands on me and release gifts into me. I had Pastor Huggins do that several times, several gifts that were released. But um, even without that, stir yourself up, fan the flame, get yourself um, keep it burning, keep it uh, alive on the inside of you. And we do that by praying in the Holy Spirit. We do that by getting into worship. We do that by being in the presence of God and his glory, by waiting on the Lord, by waiting in the hush. We are able to have God keep us strong and powerful. There's something about the breath of God, the wind of the spirit, <laughs> Some people know how to accept it and some people don't. I know when I received that anointing upon me for breathing forth the winds of the spirit and breathing the breath of God, I, it was at a Benny Hand meeting that was released on me through his right hand man who was his head intercessor and assistant and that same anointing was on him that had been on Benny and he prayed for me and loose that anointing and I've carried that all of these years it's never dissipated in fact it's grown and grown and grown well for a long time you know God said I've given you unique and unusual gifts and the body Christ won't understand how to receive them accept them or you know receive or accept you and it's like Yay, good. Oh, this would be fun. Well, no, it hasn't been fun in a lot of ways and a lot of times. I mean, I was a licensed minister and the man who I was licensed on under allowed us to preach from his pulpit. And one day I was preaching and stepped to minister and ministered to the people with the breath of God and the winds of the spirit and people were slain all over the place and then after the service he had come and said well I can't let you minister anymore and I said what because the people don't understand it the sheep don't understand it so you can preach and you could teach but I can't let you minister well, I had already been through years of not being able to preach from the first church that took me out of everything that I was in there because I went through a divorce. And it's like every church I've been in, I've had to go through some of those things. But you have to be strong. You have to stand. You have to go through them and you have to learn from them because what God has told me every time is remember this so you don't do this to my sheep when it's your turn to be in leadership. That's some of the things we walk through are really hard because you got to know what this feels like because you're going to be in leadership. And I don't want this for my sheep. I don't want them going through this. See, the thing that he should have said is a strong, powerful man of God and an apostle. He should have said, they don't understand the way you minister. So just wait until I have a chance to teach and share it with them. And tell them, you know, about it 
or share it, or you teach and talk to them about it. So I'm talking to you today, and I'm talking to the people who watch the video about the breath of God and the wind of the spirit and how God moves on that. God loves to speak on the wind of the spirit. God loves to move in the presence of God and the glory comes so strong and he will breathe the breath of life out. And I always see a change in the atmosphere, a change in what's going on in a service. Anytime that God asks me to release that, the glory will come with a much heavier and a weighty presence because God wants that release. God wants to move. So all you can do is what you can do. All you can have is what people allow you to have. And part of the process is walking through when you're not allowed to. But I believe that people being taught and being given knowledge about things like this helps them to understand and learn and be able to receive. It's like, how can you not know that it's in the word? How can you not know that John 20, 22 is Jesus saying to his disciples, peace to you. As the father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he breathed on them the breath of God. So obviously it's a part of sending people out to their call to the earth to be a minister for the Lord. And it's like, how do you not know if Jesus did it? it wasn't wrong. If Jesus did it, it was an example to us. If Jesus breathed the breath of God, then how can you say we don't understand? It's right there in the Bible that you claim to believe in and trust. So trust that <laughs> the spirit of God breathes. And I've, I've watched pastor minister that way. I've watched Dr. Lemon minister that way. In fact, I was standing <laughs> at a meeting um, with Ambassador Huggins and uh, Dr. Lemon one time, and he breathed on me, you know, and it's just like a little tiny breath. And I'm thinking, you want to just change places? Because I can probably <laughs> put you through the wall. You know, it's just, it's something very strong on me. And I've done it before in meetings where I just, the breath of God will come and God just knocks out a whole row of people. I've done that. I've experienced that. I know that it's God. I know that it's God's power. So it's like, you can tell me to your blue in the face, you will never persuade me otherwise. And I remember when, um, Benny Hen, uh, Jack Hayford was his pastor, and he cautioned him and told him, you know, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't be breathing on people, breath of God, and when they don't understand that, don't do that. And Benny for a long time stopped, and I prayed for him constantly, Lord, <laughs> I know this is real. Like the back of my hand, I know it's real. And for years, I prayed for him, and then he began to breathe the breath of God again and blow the wind of the Spirit when he was out in crusades. It's all power powerful, powerful, powerful manifestations. So you can't let yourself be dissuaded by what other people think or feel or believe. You have to stand. And no matter what God has got, called you to, you're going to have persecution. They had persecution. They only got, you know, the foundation built. And then the attacks came and the attacks come to every Christian doing anything for God. It's just a part of the process. You walk through and you get stronger and you get more mature tour so that it's just easier and easier to contend with the enemy. So if I know what God has given me is from him and I enjoy the power of the glory and the anointing that comes upon me when I'm faithful to him to do so, then why would I stop? I mean, I don't let people talk me out of what gives me the greatest joy in my life is to be able to have the glory of God. And the stronger you walk in obedience to God, the more weighty and heavy that presence of the glory comes forth. And like I was talking to Sharon before the meeting, I, every single man of God that I've tapped into this last two days is preaching the exact same thing. The breath of God, the breath of God, the breath of God, the wind of the spirit, the breath of God. And I'm going, all right. 
I'm on the right page, God. <laughs> you want this brought forth to the people who will hear this recording and to our ladies here today. And you want people to understand it because it's a powerful anointing. And if God brings it to you, don't ever say no, because it will be the best thing <laughs> that you can have on the inside of you, moving in the spirit of God in obedience to him and bringing forth his presence and his power. And so we want God on the word. We want God of the spirit. We want God moving upon the people around us. If God can stir up not one king, but two to bless the Israelites with a full supply to build a temple, why would we think his hands are shortened on our behalf? Whatever it is he's called you to, he has more than enough finances and he has a way to bring that in. He has a way to put you where you need to be so that you are being financially blessed so that you can do what he has for your life. And you just got to take that step of obedience and say, okay, God, I'm going with you because I know where the wind of the spirit is and it ain't with the father of lies. So I just like to pray before I close and I just thank you, Father God, that you are ministering to us today, strength and power and dunamis energy, Lord, to be faithful to you, strong in you, trusting in you. We will not doubt, Lord God, that you breathe upon your word, that you breathe upon your people, that you breathe upon the services in the churches around us, Father God, and in us and to us and through us, that you breathe forth over your children to step out and do what you called them to do, that all prophecy, Father God, that is of you is clean and pure and holy, and that your breath and your glory rest upon it and brings forth power and anointing to set people free, to bless them, to cause them to be able to stand and go forward in their calls and do what you have for them to do. And I just thank you, Father, for greater knowledge and understanding upon the people of the body of Christ so that they will know God moves in unique and unusual ways. And when he does, and someone steps out faithful, you better believe it's going to be filled with miracle power to do what God wants to bring on the scene. And I thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Now, Father, I just thank you that each and every person will just be blessed, be prospered, and go with God.